All right, so why don't, Randy, why don't you and Joshua take it away with Dr. Smith? I, uh, Dr. Smith, I asked uh, Randy and Joshua to uh, run, I'll, I'll be here to add, to editorialize, but let them, I know you've seen some of the results of our um, paper that we're going to submit in the next uh, uh, few weeks. Uh, I want to introduce you to Joshua Katz, who's a, uh, just received admission to the Hofstra School of Medicine, the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. So he's, uh, he's been an absolutely spectacular addition to our department. He may get the most valuable player, certainly for brain turns. And uh, I think he's probably a welcome site for all of our students uh, because he was their connection to our department all through this crazy summer that we have. So I'll turn it over to you guys to uh, talk about the results of the paper. How you doing, Dr. Smith? Hi, how you doing? So, yeah, I'm Randy. Josh, congratulations. Thank you so much. Yeah, we, we were all super excited for him. I think uh, he gave us the news a couple of weeks ago and we were, we were ecstatic. Something good had to come out of quarantine, right? Absolutely. <laughs> Well, anyway, thank you so much for being a part of this and coming along. Um, you know, we started this in the summer. I'm sure Dr. Langer filled you in. Uh, just as a, you know, there was a, a paucity of things for students to do. There was no inner, you know, there was no way to meet people. There was no way to get your name out there. There was no way to learn in the summertime, which we realized was always a very valuable part of medical education. And, um, you know, Dr. Langer, myself, Dr. Bookfar, Joshua got involved early. We, we threw together this large curriculum. We got together all these students and we just basically said, we're going to show them all of medicine, everything from administration to nursing, to PAs, to, you know, obviously physicians in neurosurgery. And the response was fantastic. And I think Dr. Langer invited you here and, and shared with you some of the survey response data that we have from the first one. And I think it's important to to kind of preface, you know, the reason we brought you in with, with who you are and what you've done. And so you're the founding dean of, of the School of Medicine. And this is a newer School of Medicine in terms of, you know, as far as medical schools go. And so before we even get going with the data, why don't you introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about how, you know, you came to establish the medical school or be a founding dean and, and your whole story. All right, sure. Randy, thanks. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll make this very brief. Uh, so, uh, so what, I, I started my interest in medicine uh, through a very circuitous route. I was actually graduated with a degree in physics. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. And, uh, and it was right at the beginning of the era of uh, biophysics departments. And uh, I went to get a PhD in biophysics, uh, worked in a lab that was doing very traditional physics work on biologic systems until they, by dumb luck, discovered cisplatinum, probably the most effective anti-cancer drug that has ever singularly been discovered. And so from, uh, from doing work on, uh, on the retina, which was the project I was, I was inheriting, the, the photo chemistry and physics of the retina, uh, everyone in the lab began to work on, on this uh, drug that we stumbled on because everyone understood it was a major, major breakthrough. And during the course of the next year, uh, I fell in love with the medicine part, which I didn't even know existed. I had never even thought for one second of becoming a physician. Uh, and so I, uh, I dropped out of my PhD program when I was admitted to uh, NYU Medical School and, uh, and went there with the uh, intent of probably continuing to do that type of research. Uh, but once again, life is interesting. And if you follow your passions, they change all the time. Uh, and I think probably the, the first day I set foot into Bellevue Hospital, I realized this was what I wanted to do. Uh, and research was interesting, but uh, diagnosing patients and taking care of patients for me personally was infinitely more interesting. Uh, and so that is, that is what I did. And I continued to follow that passion. And uh, I did my residency in internal medicine uh, and then God bless Vietnam. I was drafted. Uh, and so I, I served two years in the Army Medical Corps, mostly taking care of Vietnam veterans who were returning after uh, first pass care in a military hospital uh, closer to where they were wounded to uh, the hospital. I was at Fitzsimmons Medical Center in Denver, which was one of the three largest hospitals in the world uh, in the military and took care of lots and lots of those veterans. And uh, I did critical care there 
I did nephrology there. The army is very interesting. If they need a nephrologist, they just inform you that's what you are. Uh, and so I did, uh, I did a fair amount of nephrology and a fair amount of critical care during my time in the military. Uh, and then came out and continued to do that, but ultimately uh, established a very large uh, primary care practice and began to teach. And I found that the practicing of medicine, what I loved most was diagnosing patients and especially the ones that every other doctor got wrong. Uh, that was probably my singular favorite thing to do. Uh, and, uh, and I spent time teaching at uh, SUNY Stony Brook because it was close to where I was practicing. And uh, lo and behold, there I was minding my own business, enjoying my practice, uh, teaching for nothing. So they owed me nothing and I owed them nothing except to have fun with their medical students. And uh, they made me an offer to come full time and, and uh, run their residency program in the medical school teaching program. And uh, it was a once in a lifetime chance to uh, really do serious teaching and continue to practice. And I moved to Stony Brook and then a very famous cl clinician scientist named Barry Kohler uh, took over as the chairman of medicine at Mount Sinai. And he was a good friend of mine. And he convinced me to move into Mount Sinai and be his vice chair. Uh, and that's what I did. And I, I spent a decade at Mount Sinai. And then a guy named Michael Dowling uh, got a hold of me and convinced me that I should return to Long Island because they were building uh, a major healthcare system. And I can remember I said to him, so you're asking me to come because you think you're ready for a medical school. And he goes, no, no, a medical school is a money pit. We're not building a medical school. Don't say that under no circumstances will we build a medical school. I said, okay, fine, whatever. And I came because I really, I knew I wanted to work with, with this man. He was just such a special person. Uh, and such a visionary. And uh, well, lo and behold, not too many years passed before he calls me in and he says, so what do you think about that medical school idea? <laughs> I said, I always thought it was a really good idea. And uh, so we went, joined forces with Hofstra University and they asked me to be the founding dean. And, uh, you know, Michael and I kind of think alike. And we both said, if we're gonna build a medical school, we're building tomorrow's medical school. We're not building yesterday's medical school. And uh, he basically gave me permission to, to bring people in from all over the country, Dave Battinelli being one of the first, uh, and, and build a curriculum really built on eradicating all the mistakes of the traditional curriculum, mostly because time had passed that curriculum by, not because it had been created inappropriately, but it wasn't modernized as, as things changed in the way medicine was practiced. And it emphasized far too much about memory and not enough about uh, critical thinking. Uh, and, uh, and we had now had the technology to do that. And uh, I think, uh, Josh, you probably know this, but uh, as we get uh, a student body applying to us, even now where we just admitted our 10th class, uh, everyone understands that our curriculum is like no other medical school in the country. Uh, we absolutely trust the students to learn the facts. The facts are so easy to learn. And we help you connect the facts and connect the principles and understand how the pitch, what, what each piece of the big picture comes. But we want you to learn critical thinking right from day one because the, the thing that separates the great doctor from the mediocre doctor from the incompetent doctor is how they think. Anybody can look up facts, facts are easy. And the reason why uh, Dave Langer and uh, is, is, is a, a great neurosurgeon is not just because his hands don't shake, uh, but it's because he can conceptualize what he's doing and, and solve the problems on the fly uh, that allow him to return people back to function because that critical thinking is done in a three-dimensional world that, uh, that he, his brain has been ultimately trained to understand and to see almost immediately and put the pieces back together uh, so that he does, he does the right things. And when I have been in practice, I had a practice that was filled with patients who came to me because they didn't get better with the first doctor. And almost always the diagnosis was wrong. Because once you make the right diagnosis, I always tell people, I hate to say this, but like 
Once you make the right diagnosis, you can only, almost always find someone to treat the patient. But it's really hard to make people better if you're treating the wrong diagnosis. Uh, and uh, I found that you can teach people to not make that wrong diagnosis. But it's a lot of work and it starts from day one. And it start, starts from emphasizing critical thinking uh, on the fly and understanding how to get the right data from a patient. Uh, and to not be satisfied when you know the pieces don't fit together, but you just say, oh, but it must be this. If the pieces don't fit, it probably you're probably wrong. And you got to always just keep pushing until you know you put all the pieces together right. And it makes physiologic sense. It makes anatomic sense. It makes the symptoms make sense. And then you know you're on the right track. And then you know you can make a difference in that patient. And everything we do for four years in our medical school is about building that skill. And uh, that's so amazing. Maybe I'll stop there, Dave or <laughs> Randy. Well, yeah. So I get, I think you know we've entered into a very uh, unique point in you know the history of the world, really, with the coronavirus and and quarantine and social you know distancing and all the effects that have gone into place. Uh, you know, with the changes that you guys made with the medical school curriculum and moving forward, and I think it's a good lead into what we've done with this program and how we can all incorporate this all together. You know, has it changed much what you guys have done for the past, you know, 10 years or so? Or, or is it, are you guys basically better equipped to handle this, the future of kind of medical education, given the fact that you thought outside of the box from the get-go anyway? So obviously the technology to support the self-education piece has gotten better and better. And COVID kind of pushed us because during the periods where we couldn't convene the classes safely because of the infectivity of the virus, uh, we were forced uh, to learn how to use remote learning better and more skillfully. And that, that has helped tremendously. Uh, I think the other thing is the students have actually pushed us over these 10 years much harder than we pushed ourselves. They have resoundingly said, don't teach us facts. It's easy to learn facts. Teach us how the facts come together in the mosaic that is the human being and how the facts work together and how the systems work together. And then teach us how to figure out what's wrong. And they are adamant. So the, 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 the faculty who get really bad evaluations when they come in are the faculty that only teach facts and not teach thinking. And all you have to do is listen to you guys talk. And I'm just, I watched you today and I've watched David before. And it's all about kind of having a data dump of how your brain works when you see this problem and how you build a concept of what's going on and then what needs to be done to make that patient better. Uh, and I think the students understand that everything they do, whether it's the most common primary care problem or the most sophisticated neurosurgical problem or you know, uh, the use of an immunotherapy drug in a cancer or whatever they're doing, it's all the same thing. You've got to have a concept of the illness that's accurate, that makes physiologic sense. You have to have the trust of the patient so the data they give you is accurate and they're not afraid and they don't hold back things. Uh, and then you have to have the confidence to know when what you thought was going on must not be accurate because the person is not responding the way they should and be willing to rethink even, your mo even the, the hypotheses that you thought were absolutely great and rethink them from scratch. Uh, until you know you're on the right track. And to ask for help and to understand that medicine is a team sport. It probably always was a team sport, but now it's really clear that it's a team sport. Uh, and I think that, you know, you can be a part of the team at every layer. Uh, and I, I think what we've learned in 10 years is to listen to the students. The other thing we've learned is that that residency programs really like our graduates. And I think they like our graduates because they can think on their feet, they can collect accurate data, they can win the trust of patients very quickly and effectively, and they can work with teams and don't have to be the center of the team. The thing I want so, to say, I just want to say, uh, you know, I came from more of a conventional medical school that had been around. Me either. You know, 
Yeah, but they've been around before a woman even thought about going to medical school or even considered it. And obviously things have changed so dramatically, both in the types of kids that are going to medical school, the way we're trained, what's expected of us, the demands on us, uh, the bandwidth you have to have to be a doctor. And uh, you know, watching the Hofstra Medical School students, and this is not a plug for Hofstra Medical School, although it kind of is, uh, because that's where, we're, where we live. And we have you know, 2000 plus young, potentially pre-med students on this call. You know, I, I think that I've seen in the flesh how terrific they are and the way they come prepared. I've seen them match in great residencies. And I think just starting with your first year when you learn to be an EMT uh, was such a creative idea. And there are very few places like it. You know, I, I think uh, you, uh, you, you've done a, and your team has done just an extraordinarily good job of, I think, setting a standard for medical education. It's harder you know, Lenox Hill was kind of the same way, you know, no legacy, you can do things with what you want, you bring the people what you want, it's, it's really wonderful, you know, you, it's, while you don't have the reputation that your competitors do, you're more light on your feet, you can do things that no one questions, you, you don't have to worry about the gross anatomy instructors getting upset because you're taking time away from cadaver work or, you know, whatever it is, and so that gives you a, a clean slate, it's like powder skiing, you can make your own turns wherever you want, and you've made some great turns and we're really lucky to be able to collaborate with the medical school. I don't, I don't think brain turns would have been nearly as good without the hard work of Randy and Joshua, certainly, but uh, more importantly, the Hofstra medical students who sh showed up every day and taught all sorts of stuff. And I think that's what, well, listen to them there. They had a very sophisticated understanding of some very complicated topics in their first and second year. So they're clearly getting the education from somewhere and I think that all starts with the leadership and the team you put together. And uh, we're really lucky to be working with a great medical school like, like Zucker. So thank you for joining us today. Um, well, thank I don't know you, if you guys want to, I don't know if you guys want to see me, but I'd love for you to ping Larry about, I think this would love for you to share some of the results of our study. Uh, I, yeah, I actually sure. gave Larry a bunch of the results ahead of time to give him some thought about where healthcare is going. I think we got a remarkably unique insight into the next generation of healthcare. And that's who you people are out there. You know, you, you are the next generation. You'll be sitting here, hopefully, you'd be like a hologram or something. It won't be 2D by the time you're my age. But a long story short, uh, I think hearing about what we found out is great for you. You'll understand what we understand. We're committed to the next generation. We're committed to hiring more women, committed to hiring more diverse uh, people from different backgrounds committed to changing the way you're educated, committed to using new technology to give you information. So how much money your parents make or how, you know, what, what, what difficult circumstances you're in, because you deserve to have a chance at this wonderful, wonderful occupation that, that we uh, have all obviously ch chosen. So with that, why don't I turn it over to, to Randy and Joshua and, and, and Dr. Smith, and uh, let, let's have a great conversation with our final 30 minutes plus. Obviously, if there are any questions, keep them coming fast and furious. And I know Joshua will fill us in. Yeah, I think um, the best thing to do here, at, you know, we have a lot of interested uh, people chiming in as they go. Um, just keep the conversation going. We'll address questions as we come to it. Dr. Smith, you saw some of the data. Um, I think, you know, just kind of going top down from, from what we presented to you. You know, one of the biggest things we saw was that we had a real global engagement with brain turns. Um, we had, you know, over 80, I think, countries uh, involved, predominantly North America, United States and Canada uh, was about 90% of it. I think, you know, we, we understand the, the pathway from an American student to get into a medical school. You know, how do, how do the med schools accommodate, um, you know, people from outside of the country? What's the best way for students like that to get interested in medicine? Are there, you know, are we making more inroads for them? Sure. So, uh let me start by saying the, the traditional way that people from outside the United States get into our healthcare system is through residency training. Uh, there are a small number of positions uh, within medical schools that go to students whose uh, pre-medical school education uh, is done outside of the United States. It's not zero, but it's not a lot. On the other hand, it is a lot at the residency level. Uh, and uh, everybody should know that uh, the United States, I think, was supported and is proud of 
the thousands of graduates of foreign medical schools who have come here for training and either returned home with skills that they learned here or stayed here because in fact, we have always needed a larger number of, of physicians than we graduate from our own medical schools. And so there's been opportunities that have been endless for as long as I've been in medicine uh, of people coming here, staying, coming and going back home and then coming back and forth and, and having permanent relationships with the people that they train under. Uh, and all of those things have been positive for many of these physicians in their countries in terms of just sharing the knowledge, but it's been very positive for the United States. We would not be the medical, uh, the medical system we had without the influx of, of people coming from all over the world with prior training and enriching us with what they bring. Absolutely, yeah. Um, you know, one of the things we saw was we have uh, about 83% uh, women in the data that we sent to you. Right. Um, you know, obviously very different than I think the, what we see obviously in neurosurgery in terms of women inclusion. Um, but uh, I'm not sure about the data specifically for medical schools. Um, did you find any of that, any of those numbers kind of interesting or kind of shocking? So, you know, U.S. medical schools right now are about 50-50 men and women and have been for somewhere between five and 10 years. I mean, they've been approaching that for, for a long time. Uh, and we certainly have made a point of admitting classes that are, are pretty close, if not exactly at 50-50. Uh, because we, we know that's where, where things are, are going and there's no question about it. There's another issue though that's really important. Uh, unlike many professions, there's really good data that people who are a cultural and a linguistic match for the patients they care for get better health outcomes. They just get better outcomes. And, uh, and so there is really almost a quality and moral mandate that when you look around at, from where your patients come from, so you know, here we are, you know, in Nassau County and in Manhattan and in Staten Island uh, and in Queens, uh, if you look at where those patients come, we have an obligation to try to find a distribution of, of young physicians, young people that we train as physicians that have the ability to reach into those communities because they are where their families came from, where their upbringing came from. Uh, the language they spoke at home comes from, because all of those matches create better outcomes for patients. Uh, not just that they're more comfortable, but in fact, it's a, they get better outcomes. And so uh, we have tried very hard to never forget uh, that there's way more important things to what makes a great doctor than the score in a multiple choice exam. Uh, we have never forgotten that, although, uh, you know, the, Amer the American education system is in love with multiple choice exams. Uh, it's not just medical education, it's the whole education system in the U.S. just loves what they think is the veracity of uh, multiple choice exams. But the fact of the matter is that there's a lot that goes into graduating a class of young doctors who are going to really deliver the very best health care to the patients who live around you. And we have always have to be cognizant of that. And now as we see the emphasis on the social determinants of health and realizing that, uh, you know, as a physician, you have a lot to do with the medical care, the diagnosis and the treatment and the follow-up. But in fact, if you don't have an understanding of how to at least help people deal with, with the social determinants of health, you're never going to get great outcomes. And COVID was a classic example uh, of where uh, we saw that uh, you know all the elements of uh, of poverty played out uh, in the overcrowding of neighborhoods and the difficulties getting healthcare and the lack of prevention and the poor diets and the untreated hypertension and on and on and on were things that really, really punished the outcomes of those neighborhoods with a virus that was handled much better by people not from those areas. Uh, and if it's ever become clear that we're not gonna be the people who build new housing, but we need to understand all those things and intervene and be advocates for patients and their communities so that we don't see uh, the terrible toll that COVID played on those particular neighborhoods. And that's just you know, one example I could go on and on with, with uh, 
the role of the physician, not necessarily the personal skill set of the physician, but the role in advocating for things that create better health for their patients. Yeah. Uh, we have actually a great a great question from one of the students, and it correlates with some of our data. So, you know, we looked at self-reported income of uh, or family income of participants in brain turns. Right. And we actually saw that we covered, you know, pretty much all the demographics. I think, you know, people who made less than 15000 a year, we were a little bit underrepresented, which is, you know, obviously, you know, below the poverty level. Um, but one of the students is asking about socioeconomic diversity within medical students. Um, and I guess, you know, obviously from a medical school dean perspective or from an enrollment perspective, you know, what what things exist to uh, to accommodate that or to, to, to help people in, you know, the lower socioeconomic groups, you know, pursue their dreams and follow medicine. Right. So uh, everybody should understand that for certainly as long as I've been in medicine, the medical school enrollment has disproportionately come from the upper deciles of income. Uh, of family income. Uh, and that has been true for as long as I think they've ever collected data. Uh, that being said, uh, Mr. Zucker of the Zucker School of Medicine, Mr. and Mrs. Zucker, who are, are you know, the, the reason why the school is named after them and, and probably people who see the world as close to the way I see it uh, as I could have. When they gave me the first very large endowment for the medical school that they named, and hopefully they, they intend to continue to, to, to add to that endowment. The only use I can have of that endowment is scholarship money for students from poor families. I cannot use it for any other use whatsoever. And we, we negotiated that restriction on the endowment so that if all of us leave, the school is still permanently committed uh, to using that money to make up the difference uh, between the people who come from families where they can easily afford medical education and the people who often thought they were incapable of becoming doctors because they didn't have the resources. And so, although it isn't enough money for me to give every student that I wish, every dollar I, I wish I could, it was an enormous jump forward and it will continue to be so. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's. A fantastic point. Um, I'm scrolling through some of the questions here real quick. You know, while, while I'm looking through for some questions, was there anything about the data that you saw that you think stands out to you? Um, you know, obviously this is, it's a non-traditional form of education using this webinar, right. but we were forced, you know, we were forced to do something, I think just, you know, we felt obligated to. And, you know, uh, just your opinion on the, on the process, the, the formulation of it, you know, some of the results we've shown you. Well, first of all, the numbers are stunning. Uh, absolutely, absolutely stunning, the number of people that joined this program. And so that too is a lesson in the ease of reaching out to very large groups of people who are comfortable uh, living in the world of commuter connections uh, and learning. Yeah. Uh, so we better get better and better at teaching over this modality because- I'll tell you, uh, you know, we have 22 crowd. Oh, absolutely. We got 2,200 active listeners right now. And enrolled in this, we have 7,600. Um, that'll be, you know, the majority will be reviewing this remotely over YouTube because everything will go to a, uh, you know, to a site there, all the recordings. So right. I agree. It's, it's absolutely incredible. Um, the fact that this happened, you know, that, that all came based on what people responded anyway from social media. Right. Uh, this is a, just a huge social media influx of people, um, which is also pretty incredible in terms of, you know, what the internet has done to, you know, global communication and, and you know, cohesiveness, I guess. Right. Well, you know, one of the things I'll just tell you while you're looking, uh, you know, what COVID did to our curriculum. Well, we had to teach remotely during times when it was truly dangerous to put such clusters of people mm -hmm. together in one room. But then we immediately recognized that COVID was unleashing uh, the patient's desire to have televisits, both the convenience and the safety of the televisit. And now all of our medical students have time doing televisits as well as in-person per visits. No one leaves our medical school not understanding how you do tele-ICU and a tele-primary care visit. Uh, 
you know, and, and, and a telepediatric visit, et, et cetera. Because now that we've, we just decided that had to be part of the regular curriculum because medicine has changed. Uh, Absolutely, I mean, I, I personally love telemedicine. I think it does lend itself to neurosurgery in a very specific way. We're very imaging based. Uh, as long as the images are done, we can review the films. There's something there, there's something not there. I think it gives you a very unique insight into a patient. Uh, when you look into their home, and you see how they live, it gives you so much more information than when someone's sitting in front of you in the office, you know? Um, and that stuff all plays a role when you're thinking about, you know, the decisions you're gonna make to help treat someone and what they're able to do. You know, it's easy to prescribe a complex brain surgery to someone, but if they've got no one at home to help them, or you can see that they've got a flight of stairs behind them that you're not gonna be able to walk up, those decisions, they weigh, you know, in, in your decision-making. And so absolutely critical. Um, do you one see thing the I was future? Gonna, one thing I just wanted to add is I think, yeah. um, one of the reasons that brain turns is I think it's emblematic of, we didn't think of this ahead of time, but we realized it afterwards, just the power of this and the importance of using these modalities for medical schools uh, and how we might do that. So Larry, have you thought about, I know telehealth's one thing, but think about, you know, I, I talk about telesocial also, like the concept of using a telehealth platform in the hospital or with families while patients are in the hospital especially in COVID, you know, we want being, not being face-to-face -face and being remote could have health reasons, you know, not going into patients' rooms all the time. Um, what, what, where do you see health, the, the hospitals and maybe even medical schools, where, are they, where, where do you see the technology impacting the educational piece as well as the patient care piece? So, you know, in the patient care, the things that I saw, uh, you know, created because of COVID. Uh, whether it was, you know, the technicians who worked in the hospitals themselves. Uh, the first thing I saw when I went from ICU to ICU was people figured out it was a really bad idea to have to go into the room every time an alarm went off. And at, at a number of our hospitals, the local technologists in the hospital who mostly did repairs on equipment as their usual job, had designed jury rigged systems to respond to almost all of the alarms that were going off on the monitoring devices from outside the room. So you didn't have to keep, you know, changing your gowns and changing your garb and going in and, and risking, uh, you know, taking COVID with you as you left the, uh, left the patient's room. And clearly that's gonna be a permanent change in critical care and the, the, the monitoring systems that don't figure that out quickly will be left in the dust. Uh, and, you know, then you realize that uh, the thing that most struck me, and I'll just, I'll, uh, you guys were all there too. Every time I looked at the ICUs during COVID time, I never saw such an inhuman, terrible way to have patients. Lying face down, there was no sound in the ICUs. Every patient was paralyzed and on a ventilator. Uh, there were no visitors. No one came up to you and asked you a question advocating for the patient because there were no visitors in the whole hospital. And it was really a hard way to be critically ill and a lonely way to die. Uh, and we better figure out all of these things because of all the things I witnessed in COVID, that was the thing that just absolutely tore my heart out because never ever did I see even the most tragic ICU functioning like a silent living morgue. And that's what these ICUs were like during COVID. And we're gonna have to figure that out. You know, a student uh, brings up- We can't a, do that again. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with you a hundred percent. I do see um, a question from a student that I think brings up a valuable point. Yeah. And they're asking, do you see telehealth reducing human connection and comfortability between patients and their doctors? And I actually think, you know, I, I mean, I don't know about you, but I've been on a hundred Zoom calls in the past <laughs> 10 months with my family, not even just brain turns. Um, and my kid gets to look at his grandma, you know, my, my wife gets to see her family, I get to see my family. And I think it's it's the same thing, there's connection there. And I think it's the same thing when I, when I talk to patients, there's connection there immediately. In fact, you know, one of my policies is I, I like to see patients within 24 to 48 hours, any new patient. Um, I deal with a lot of back pain. And so, you know, people in pain want to be seen. And I'm a, I, I consider myself a brain tumor specialist. People with brain tumors want to be seen. I'm able to get on the phone the same day, the same hour 
right? And I'm introduced into their life and they see me and I see them and I see their life immediately. So I think if anything, there's increased connection and comfortability with, with doctors. Now, my second point to that is there's a flat screen TV in every hospital room at this point. My cell phone has five cameras on it. You know, you know how are we not putting cameras on every single hospital bed or in every room and, and letting people communicate? Absolutely. You know, I think the things we will learn is don't be infatuated with the technology and don't be afraid of it. Because yeah. I agree with you, you can have tremendous human connection, but there will probably be things that you recognize after a while that you can't do as well on a televisit. And you have to be open to saying to the patient, I know you love these televisits, but you have to come see me for this, you know, because there are things I can't do through this teleconnection. Uh, on, the, on the flip side, you know, we're going to not want to just bring people in and inconvenience them when we know that the quality and the effect of the televisit is equal to the in-person visit. Uh, and so there's going to be you know, a test of our own honesty uh, when, when we know that we need to bring them in and when we know we don't need to bring a person in. We can do the exact same thing. And the thing we haven't had, and this may be the challenge of, of every bioengineer, is we still haven't gotten good at the telephysical exam. The technology has not caught up. And I believe it's just the creativity of, of bioengineering will allow us to do telephysical exams. But right now, that unfortunately is a gap. Uh, but when, it's a gap yeah, that we should be when, pushing people to close that gap. When you compare it to going back to catheters and open surgery, the same thing, you know, you, the technology is good enough to do safely most many things, but are you missing the human interaction? Sure, it's not the same, but it's close. The question is what the threshold is to bring people in the hospital, to find them to cross the river, to park, to come up to a waiting room, sit there. So but the, you have to balance off the risk and the benefit. For just a fall visit after surgery, everything's fine. It's 100% home run. But for a case that might have a wound to check or a specific neurological deficit or seeing how strong their hand is if they have a, a, a spinal cord problem or listening their lungs or listening their heart, or examine their prostate, you know, you're gonna need face-to-face -face forever. So it's, it's a matter of balance. It's, Absolutely. You know, that's working. So um, did, guys, did you guys go over the demographics of the paper? I don't, we, we got the, yes. oh, you did, okay. Yes. And the importance of TikTok. <laughs> hey, we, yes, we and, did go and, over and, and the diversity that, it, that emerges from such a, a web of uh, recruiting students. Well, I think there's also a Bob bias, you know, it's who's using social. And that's who's fine, you know, so, and I think that that, that that may reflect, you know, more than we like to believe, but by the same token, uh, it needs to be respected. I think my personal view of this after their great work and reading through, you know, some of the results was the profound importance is like, we're not going to give up all the other ways that we train students or attract students or, right. but absolutely we have to use these things for a different generation that gets their information differently, that thinks differently, that has no problem, you know, getting information from a source that we would consider crazy. And so it's, it, we, we have to have the eyes wide open with this. And I think Brain turns a great example of that. Yep. I think, you know, it, what it is, is it's, it's thinking in the same fashion as the people you need to be the thinkers, right? The, the young generation is thinking the way the future is going to think. And, Absolutely. Uh, and we're teaching medicine the way that it was taught to us, maybe with slight innovations, how we think it might be improved upon. Um, but there's definitely a, a generation gap and there's an information gap. And if you want leaders or thought leaders in medicine, then you need to, like Dr. Langer said, get down to the level uh, and, and appeal to them in some way. Definitely. So, and, you know, Randy, I, I want to go back to one of the things you said. So every person, every person who is handed a diagnosis of cancer, no matter how readily it can be treated or how completely it can't be treated, is in a state of total panic. And you and I both know that with a televisit, an hour later, you can see what was done, what wasn't done, what things need to be done, how to collect the information, how to get someone to look at the pathology if there was a biopsy. And so that when the person comes in five days later, yeah. that it's not a hello and a wasted visit. It, you already have put in motion the process of taking care of them. Yeah, absolutely.
Yeah, I think it's a, it's a huge benefit to ramp up medical care without a doubt. I, I do think there is a, a few things. There's a technological gap where we figure out how best to utilize it, that there's still a learning curve on. And then some of the students have pointed out a generational gap. There's older individuals, individuals with a second language as well, who don't, you know, they don't get into the telehealth immediately. They still feel more comfortable seeing a doctor, even if the doctor is going to tell them there's nothing I can do at this point, you know, right? Um, they prefer that. And so yeah, and we have to be that, cognizant of those things. Yeah, that's it. You just make, you know, make slight adjustments as you go through. Um, we're about 15 minutes out. So yeah, yeah I came uh, here from TikTok is a great, great comment in the comments. <laughs> yes. We, have, uh, we actually can um, get on with Roth. Like we can watch a little bit of this if you'd like. Do you want to see some? I'm, I'm down. I think the students would be interested. We can continue this conversation. First of all, Dr. Smith, um, yeah. just thank you. Good. What, you guys move on. I'll, I'm, I'm watching you. Yeah, you were, it was, uh, it's just, I know that look, seeing the comments, I think the students were just blown away that you would take the time to do this with us. And um, I think that's just a reflection of the commitment you've made to student education, education in general. And I think that your participation here means a ton to us. Uh, obviously, we're a relatively small blip on the body of Northwell, but we, um, we're committed to helping the medical school spread the word of its greatness and contribute to that greatness and, and, and be educators ourselves in this little small area called you know, neurosurgery. And uh, I, again, I appreciate the, all the work the medical, Hofstra medical students have done as well. It's been huge contributions. So thanks for joining us and please join, stay along as long as I'd also having you along for Kate Carrico would be great too. I think that's gonna be a remarkable uh, talk with her. Okay, I'll, I'll mute myself so I don't I can uh, make noise and not interfere with you. Let's look in on Raphael for a sec. Uh, I'll share my screen. Can't even keep up with the comments. The thank yous for Dr. Smith are just pouring in. Oh, so uh, guys, we're online. Raf, you're you're on. You're live. Okay, so we are uh, we in position. Uh, we we were able to get uh, to the area of fistula with the microcatheter. Um, one question that we always have is: Are, are we in the safe uh, area to embolize? That's uh, the discussion that we had this morning. Based on our geography, we are in a safe position because we don't see any normal arteries coming from the uh, uh, nidus of the AVM. Um, we're doing right now what's called a provocative test, which is injecting an anesthetic to simulate what would happen if we close our artery permanently. So we have the microcatheter in place and we injected uh, 40 milligrams of lidocaine. Uh, we had some baseline monitoring. There are specialists that do uh, neurophysiologic monitoring and check the electrical conductivity and check the strength of the uh, muscles and the uh, conductivity of the nerves. Uh, they did that as a baseline. And right now we're doing it continuously for the next 10, 15 minutes until we confirm that there is no change in the, uh, in the potentials of the nerves. So Raf, uh, I'm gonna just, um, this, is, this is again, that the, the same shepherd's hook catheter. And then here's his micro catheter. And you can see the, this is the feeder to the AVM. That, that, that's the vein. The, the, that's the vein, the, the, the feeder, you don't see it here because I'm distal to it. Oh, I see. Oh yeah, this is the vein coming out. I see, yeah. yeah. The vein coming up. So, oh, because they're in the AVM, okay. Yes, it has a very similar shape as the, as the feeder, but now we're distal, uh, so we're very far in to the feeder. Um, I'm gonna go and check that the monitoring is good. And if it's good, we're gonna go ahead and inject the glue. Great, we're watching. So I think um, he's going to go back in. You're going to see him step back into the uh, room now. It has, this is the table. This is the, uh, there's a basically two planes. There's an AP plane and you're seeing another. It's basically two x-ray positions. And I think you've seen these before. Dr. Ortiz is going to stand in this spot right here and you'll see him step in. Uh, this is the, the right femoral area, the groin. Uh, the left side is here. So right, left, here are the feet, the head somewhere up here. And he's going to go back, and uh, we'll, we'll pro he'll probably do a little bit of a run, just to see how this is all uh, uh, laying out. 
Randy, what's our our next uh, at, is our next speakers at eleven? Is that the diversity? It is. It's the diversity lecture at eleven. Okay. So I, I just and here they just turn the lights on in the room for a second. You know, I just can't um, emphasize enough the uh, importance of Dr. Smith's um, ethic and the ethic of the medical school. I I I think that. Look, Hofstra is not the only medical school that feels this way. I think we are very sensitive to the importance of uh, opening ourselves up to the next generation. I think the Netflix show actually opened my eyes to a lot of this because of the reaction um, that uh, who was watching and who it influenced. And um, you know, as a as a bunch of white guys, uh, which is the way healthcare used to look. We have to be very open, you know, you have to somehow look beyond yourself. I think Dr. Smith's, uh, you know, 10, 15 years ahead of me and um, he's there. And I think that's what's happening right now. So anyone can do this. There was a question about, someone I saw with a disability or, uh, you know, depends on what the disability is. Obviously there's actually a pediatric neurosurgeon who's the chairman of University of Michigan who is paraparetic, almost paraplegic. She operates in a wheelchair. There are huge difficulties of doing these things, but we, we as a, a, a healthcare system and as a group have to open our eyes to the value and the importance of, of hard work. And it doesn't matter where you're from or what your sexual uh, orientation is or what the color of your skin is. If you do the work, you ought to be able to be a physician. Unfortunately, there are um, realities to this. I think there were some questions about grades and scores and unfortunately, the reason why those are important is not because they really matter at our, at, at our stage, but there's thresholds that schools use. Uh, and even in residency, we used to use board scores, that these are thresholds that it doesn't mean there aren't kids that would have done just fine if they didn't do as well. But those thresholds, unfortunately, are in place because they can't possibly spend as much time on all the applicants. So unless you can you get through those, they're, they're artificial for sure, but you can't unfortunately get around them. And they exist for uh, un unfortunately a, not the best reason, but it is a reason. And uh, unfortunately they're gonna be there. So work hard, you have to study hard and you have to get good, you have to really do well. And then you, you have a shot and then there, hopefully there'll be people like us that can help you. So going back to Dr. Ortiz, he's gonna, he's back in his room, he's gonna do a run you can see his microcatheter here. Now he's injecting contrast. This is the AVM, and here's the vein coming out of it. It's a tiny microcatheter there. I think he's probably getting ready to um, uh, to inject. Hopefully, the glue. Yeah, they're gonna they're gonna mix the glue off the side. I used to be able to move the camera. I, for, for some reason there, we're not gonna be able to get the camera to move. But what they're doing is they're mixing, the glue has to be mixed with a different components to make it either a little thinner or a little thicker before he injects it. And he's going to do that now. Look like they're going to turn the camera so you can watch him mixing the glue there. These are the little things that make interventional so interesting. They're, um, it's just, this is pretty much kind of old fashioned. He's, this is actually a tongue depressor, a sterile tongue depressor that he's mixing the, uh, what's called a thiodol, which is a, a, uh, a, a solvent with the actual glue itself. And he's gonna draw the glue up into these little syringes. That's dextrose. He's, he's rinsing the, the, the tubes with, with a sugar. So he was at the hardware store earlier, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So now he's gonna pull the, glue, pull the glue up with this little syringe. And we're going to see a glue injection, guys. This is super cool. <laughs> Dr. Langer, can you make your um, live stream 
window full screen, they're asking. Is that better? Yeah. Patient is supine uh, for okay, those so asking. This is the microcatheter. It goes all the way around like that. And the tip of it's somewhere in here. It's hard to see. Now, Dr. Ortiz is going to hook that glue up to the catheter. So this is the end of the catheter. He's going to hook this. Is, he's going to put the glue. I think he's going to irrigate. Here you can see the blue. That's the microcatheter. That's the size of the end of it, not the tip. So he's going to inject, he's going to inject some contrast here now. There's the contrast on this left screen. This is frozen up here on the right. And now he's going to start injecting the glue, I think. Let's watch. Here's the tip. You'll see black stuff coming out of it. And he's going to pull the catheter very quickly because there was that question about reflux before. Here you go, here comes the glue. That's it, see how it's black? He puts little black particles there so you can see it, watch. Right here, you'll see the glue coming. He's gonna pull the catheter out really quickly. Watch that little tip, there it goes, there is the glue. Coming in. Now he pulled. So he pulled the whole catheter out as he got reflux. So there's the glue cast right there. Now he's gonna check. You see that black is all the glue inside the AVM. And they're just checking that they have the whole catheter. How many injections will he do, you think? He just did one. You only, you only get with each each injection with glue, you got to pull it out. Yeah. So if you're going to do another yeah. injection, you have to readvance the catheter in. It's uh, There's other materials called onyx, which is like a crazy, which is like a, has like a toothpaste consistency. And you can push that for 20 minutes. Yeah. Because it's not as sticky. It's, it's, um, it's a colloid and it doesn't harden. And so it doesn't, you can do multiple injections. So I think he's probably gonna do a run now through the, the big catheter. Let's watch him do a run. And then we have to get on with our diversity lecture. Any questions over there? They wanna know why the dextrose. It cleans out the catheter. It, it allows the glue to flow through without, without polymerizing. The minute the glue hits any blood, it causes polymerization or it solidifies. The, you got to push the glue out and the pH of the blood hardens it. And so it comes out as a liquid and then it turns into a solid. So you, you irrigate that catheter to get rid of any blood products with dextrose. It's, it's, a, it's a, a neutral um, solution so you don't get hardening of the glue. You can see in real time, he's going back up there with that shepherd's hook catheter. You see this is the spine because he's, and he has to find the entrance to that, that intercostal artery that's feeding the AVM. The spinal cord sits sort of in, in this kind of space in the spine, right in there. That's where the spinal cord is. So what happens if he doesn't pull fast enough? If the, if the, if the catheter, catheter gets stuck? If the glue refluxes along the catheter and the catheter gets stuck and you can leave a chunk of catheter in the body, which isn't good. You just leave it though, right? Yeah. So you can see, um, yeah, but it could be a real problem and cause infection, yeah. you can injure an artery. Here you can see that shepherd's hook catheter He's accessing the, uh, the artery that, that feeds the AVM again. And now he's just injecting carefully just until he gets into the right spot so he can do the run to make sure everything looks okay. You can barely see it. I know it's small guys. Unfortunately, I can't expand each one of these, uh, but there's, I think that you can see the glue cast right there. I'm on a big screen so I can see it. So just so everyone knows, we've brought in um, the members of the diversity lecture. And just so they're aware of what's going on, we're actually viewing a live gluing of a spinal cord arterial venous malformation in real time. Um, and so here comes we'll the run. Here, here comes one the more run. run here. Yep. So there's the, there's the contrast coming out. This, this thing's blocking it. I, I don't necessarily, for some reason, this black thing is right over it, but um, they're just, there you go. I don't see that AVM. 
<laughs> I see a little, I see a little vein, but I don't see a big nidus anymore. So Bye -bye. that means it's probably, it's probably feeding from somewhere else. Roth will get on. Roth, can you hear me? Yeah, we hear you. Yeah. So as you saw, we injected uh, the NBCA mixture with Phylo and Tantalum so that we could see it better on the X-ray because it's so, so, such a small feeder. Um, no obvious direct supply from this feeder anymore. And yeah. uh, monitoring is good. Uh, she's at baseline motor and sensory evoke potentials. We're gonna do uh, the rest of the angiogram just to confirm that it's not feeling from anybody in, anywhere else. Now in this picture, what's very interesting is not, now the anterior spinal artery is much more obvious. You can see that the top of the loop, the small artery going north, going up at the top of the loop. Yep, you see it there, straight up. So, so the, it was the supply to anterior spinal artery, but we were so distal to it that, that it was safe for us to embolize. Again, we will check the rest of the angiogram. I don't know if you have, guys have time for that or not, uh, but this went very well. And uh, that was great. We saw the whole yeah, thing. We saw the glue come out. We saw you pull the catheter. We saw you mixing it. The guys in the Andrews really helped out because I don't have, uh, I don't, for every the software right now, I can't move the camera and stuff. So tell them they did, a, they did a great job. Thank you. Thank them. Great. Great. So we have here. a diversity <laughs> lecture. We're one minute late. We're going to go to that. If you want to call back with anything else, we're happy to join in. But that was absolutely well timed to end at 11 o'clock. I appreciate the glue going in at 10:59. It was <laughs> we planned it that way. It's good for the drama, right? Yeah. For anybody listening, uh, please forward to them the, my LinkedIn or my Twitter, or whatever. That way they can uh, reach out and I can answer any questions. Thanks, Rafael. Absolutely. Okay. We'll put it in the chat. Take care. All right. With